The fallout from yesterday's drama in the house is rippling like waves in an octogenarian <laughs> pond. <laughs> Acting Speaker <laughs> Patrick McHenry has ordered former Speaker Nancy Pelosi to vacate her special Capitol Hill hideaway office by today in what some online are calling an act of revenge. Pelosi derided the decision as a, quote, sharp departure from tradition. Additionally, Republicans on the bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus are considering quitting the group en masse after Democrats in the group voted to oust uh, McCarthy per reporting from CNN. And meanwhile, Republicans are busy dealing with the eight rebels who votes sent McCarthy packing. This morning, Representative Mike Lawler said they deserve to face punishment. Uh, I think there needs to be a reckoning uh, within the conference. Uh, there needs to be accountability uh, for the eight individuals who selfishly upended our House majority uh, and put their own interests above the country, above the conference, and above the institution behind us. What does accountability look like? Uh, to me, in my personal opinion, they need to lose their committee assignments uh, and there needs to be consideration as to whether or not they're even part of the conference. So first of all, I didn't even realize there were these kind of special offices Hideaway before offices, this story. Yeah. So you seem to have some familiarity with yeah, them. Yeah, so, so they're, they? they're usually reserved for leadership, very senior members. Um, you, you probably could walk past the door, Bree, and wouldn't know. They're usually just like a random number on the door, and they're nice. They're usually in very nice places, um, in the chambers, very lavish, nice furniture. So if people don't know this, uh, members have catalogs where they can sort of choose furniture and pictures to have brought into these offices. Mm. And the fact that Pelosi actually still had it, I was a bit surprised because she's no longer in leadership. Mm -hmm. But I assume because her and Cindy Hoyer have been around for so long, uh, leadership felt sort of respectful to sort of give them these places. And it's where they can have private meetings, uh, bring very, very high profile people in. I mean, it's I'm not going to lie, if I ever ran for office, I wouldn't mind having a hideaway <laughs> office, Bree. So, you know, she made a statement about how because she is in California mm -hmm. um, attending um, the the final resting place services of Diane Feinstein, she wasn't able to pick up her yeah. belongings in, in a kind of a shady statement that suggests that she feels like she's being treated wrongly, this is an act of revenge, et cetera. But obviously, more important than the petty squabbles of who gets to put their lamp where in uh, <laughs> congressional office buildings is this question of what is going to happen to these eight House Republicans who voted to oust yeah. uh, Kevin McCarthy. So these people are Andy Biggs of Arizona, Ken mm -hmm. Buck of Colorado, Tim Burchett of Tennessee, Eli Crane of Arizona, Matt Gates, of course, Bob Good of Virginia, Nancy Mace of South Carolina, and Matt Rosendell of Montana. Now, in the clip we watched at the end, um, the suggestion was, well, maybe they should be stripped of their committee appointments, et cetera. But remember, part of how some of these Freedom Caucus people got their plum committee assignments in the first place is because they held 15 rounds of yeah. voting for yeah. Kevin McCarthy in January. And in the course of doing that, not only got committee assignments, but the ability to do exactly what Matt yeah. Gage just did, which is to have one member of the House instigate these, this motion yeah. to vacate. So how now are you going to rein in that power and censor people when they still have this continued ability to do this as many times as they want to do it. They, they do, and, and that's something that the House is going to have to deal with. They need to have a rule change. The problem is, Bree, at least from my understanding of, of the way the House rules are structured, you would need Democrats to change the rule. Like, it's, it's a weird thing. And I was talking to a couple of folks last night on trying to figure out, like, what are you guys going to do to prevent this from happening to the next speaker? Otherwise, we're going to be at this place again in nine months. Uh, they've already, the leadership, they're very upset about this. Most of the members are very upset about this. I want to remind the viewers, over 200 members of the Republican, almost all of them, voted for Speaker McCarthy, mm -hmm. except eight individuals. Uh, Matthew Gates right now was, had some line item things in the budget. They just announced today they're stripping all of those things for his congressional district. Uh, I, I presume the same will happen for each and every one of those other individuals. Nancy Mace, I was with some folks yesterday, uh, Republicans who sit on a couple boards that endorsed her when she had trouble running for office and getting reelected the last time around. They're going to now contest by supporting someone else. I mean, these guys and ladies, they're, they're going to have some serious issues in 2024. The conference isn't happy about this. And, and to your point, McCarthy gave these folks almost everything they wanted. He gave them committee assignments, even, by the way, Bree, when other members didn't advise him to do so. But he said, you know what, if they're going to support me, I have to respect what they've asked for. And well, he did that. He did that. They forced his hand. I don't know how much you can credit Kevin McCarthy's kind of largesse to giving him those committee assignments. 
these Freedom Caucus folks held him over but, but, a barrel but, but, for 15 but, but, but votes until say, he had to capitulate. That's true, but can I say uh, Nancy Mason as an example? When Nancy Mason was crying all over national television because Donald Trump was attacking her and people were showing up at her home and she needed money to run for re-election because she almost lost the race because the viewer, the, the voters didn't think she was conservative enough. It was Kevin McCarthy who transferred $3 million out of the Protect the House PAC money to make sure that Nancy Mace returned back to Congress, and then she stabs, not even in the back, I mean, she just cut the guy's throat right in front of him. That's just what she did. Well, that's an interesting... And to me, that's just disloyal. Well, that, that's an interesting point, because Democrats are framing these eight uh, so-called rebels as um, right-wing, um, the most extremist members of the Republican Party. And uh, your example of yeah. Ma Nancy Mace really suggests otherwise. To your point, she was considered to be not Republican mm -hmm. enough. She's one that has been trying to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, chart a more moderate and she's not a Trump on fan. She's not a she's, Trump fan. <clears throat> exactly. We had her on the show and she was saying a lot of, I mean, for her caucus, reasonable sounding things, mm -hmm. more mainstream sounding things about uh, abortion rights. So this really is a mixed bag. And I think the, the, the success of Matt Gates and anyone who's standing with him in this moment and the, uh, the negative ramifications of this, it's going to come down to whether or not they're going to be able to pitch in their districts that they stood up for something that their voters support that they think is a righteous cause and that to the extent that they are punished personally or their district is punished mm -hmm. because uh, funding is stripped from yeah. budget items that were going to mm -hmm. benefit their voters, that they need to be able to frame it as Congress is punishing you because I stood up for your rights and interests. And if they are able to do that, I think that ultimately it reflects poorly on the Republican Party for, for example, not listening to the majority of the, the, Amer uh, the public who have questions about sending over $100 billion to Ukraine yeah. when that amount of money could be used to cancel all medical debt, to end homelessness, and to do any but, number but of I, other but, domestic policies. But, but I would say, Bree, to Republican voters, you need to redirect your ire to the Senate. It is the Senate Republicans that continue to advocate for funding for Ukraine. It's not most of the House Republicans. And people need to understand the House does not have unilateral authority in the budget process to say, this is what we want, this is what we're stripping, and we're going to send it to Biden to sign. They have to negotiate this, ladies and gentlemen, with the United States Senate. They don't have a choice. And so the speaker can say, I want money for Border Patrol, because that is what most Republicans want in a conference. Sure. And the Senate's going to say, well, that's fine. But if we're going to agree to this, you have to give us $50 billion for Ukraine. And so, Bree, this puts up a very interesting scenario to the point that you just made about having to negotiate with Matt. What's the next speaker going to do when he or she goes to the Senate minority leader, McConnell, and then the majority leader, Schumer, and say, well, look, I can't pass anything without a significant amount of funding for Border Patrol. And now they're called, the conference is saying, we don't want anything for Ukraine. So then you have a stalemate. Yeah, exactly. That is the whole point. Look, I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I'm going to beat away. Sorry, horse, because <laughs> this is where we are. This is literally the scenario that existed mm -hmm. over something like the $15 minimum wage. And as everyone who's watched oh, me talk yeah. ad nauseum on this show mm -hmm. knows, in Florida, home of Donald Trump and Matt Gates, a Republican and DeSantis, and DeSantis mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> on that 2020 ballot was a $15 minimum wage and it passed with 60% of the vote. This is a popular policy. We have not had a minimum wage raise since 2009, the longest period of time in American history. Wages are not keeping up with inflation. People are poor. They can't afford groceries. People need more money in their pocket. Yeah. Okay. That being said, one of Biden's core promises, one of his core campaign promises he made to Bernie and the rest of America when, he, when Bernie dropped out of the race was that he was going to pass a $15 minimum wage. There was a $15 minimum oh, wage how? as part Part of this first COVID package that Biden passed, uh, it was a must-pass reconciliation bill. Remember, he okay. had yep. two bites of the apple to mm -hmm. pass legislation with only 50 plus one, uh, one uh, vote in the mm -hmm. Senate because the, they had these narrow margins. They went through this whole charade about how a parliamentarian, which is a ceremonial position, a person that can be fired who has no control over what is actually voted on or not. Their edict that uh, a $15 minimum wage was not something that should be included in a budget reconciliation bill meant that they had to strip it from the bill. And so we never got this exact situation. Yeah. That's what we wanted. Because what we wanted was for, for Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema to have to argue to the American public while they were not going to vote for this huge 
COVID aid package that was going to disperse vac vaccines and get the economy going again, a must-pass package that everybody across the aisle wanted, all because they refused to support a popular policy but, but like a $15 minimum wage. But, and that is this. Is Congress, is the Senate going to sit here and say, we'd rather have a government shutdown, we'd rather not fund the border, we'd never, rather not fund homeless kids, we'd never not do anything, because we feel so strongly about sending aid to Ukraine, even though the bulk of the American public does not want this to happen. These are the kinds of teed up issues that we never get because we never have single issue bill voting, something else that Matt Gaetz is advocating for. And I think he's right. And we never we never the, the, the con Congress members specifically rig the process so that everyone just accepts that they're going to have to get this big bolus of crap, oftentimes that nobody has even read through getting thousands of pages the night before a vote. And say, oh, well, we win some, we lose some. Yeah, but, but okay, so can I say McCarthy did agree to 72 hours uh, to, to review a bill? That's what most Republicans wanted. Um, in terms of uh, voting on single issues, pieces of legislation versus bulk pieces of legislation, which does make it really hard, McCarthy actually did support that. Uh, but I, I recognize the point. I can see that it's a very good point. I will say this, though. This is sort of part of the course for Joe Biden and making these undeliverable promises or hell, maybe promises Bree, that he just doesn't plan to keep anyway. Amen to that. I mean, he said, I'm going to forgive all the student debt well, unilaterally. 10 to 20,000 uh, per person if you make then, under $125,000 a year. But then sure. he went on to say, well, if, you're, <laughs> if, if you ain't black, if you don't vote for me, mm -hmm. then he went on to make all these additional promises that I'm going to get small businesses back again, especially those in disadvantaged communities where 50 plus percent of black businesses and Latino businesses were decimated during the COVID. He makes all of these promises mm -hmm. and then never delivers. And then say, well, you should be happy because no one has done more for hardworking people, for black people, for members of whatever community you may want to be a part. No one's done more than Joe yeah, Biden. He acts like it's a hostage situation. He's owed this in his mind. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is absurd. You're not owed anything, Joe Biden. People haven't forgotten about mass incarceration from the lines, but you can't even bring that stuff up because then when you do, then Democrats say, well, then you're going to support Donald Trump or you're going to support exactly. Republicans or you, you must not really be about black people or struggling people if you don't vote for Joe Biden. And it's like what Dr. West said. How arrogant is that, that people can't think for themselves who they want to support? Exactly. That is the core of Vote Blue No Matter Who. And that is the hostage game that these corporate Dems and corporate Republicans have been playing for a really long time. And what I find to be so energizing and fascinating about what Matt Gates is doing is that he's flipping it on its head. And he's demonstrating that he's not the only one who could have been doing this. Conservatives, corporatists do this all the time. They hold up bills like Mansion and Cinema did. Mm -hmm that are going to be good for the interests of poor and working people all the time. And there's never any of this grandstanding. Nobody really cares. Everyone accepts it. Oh, it must not be popular. When in fact, it's, it's, it's the very things that they're obstructing usually are the most popular, but we never really get that conversation teed up because those bills are never isolated. And um, the establishment figures in Congress get to say, well, we had to do bipartisan compromise. We're the good guys because we compromise. But they're always compromising on the interests of poor and working people. They're never com compromising on the pipelines that are going to inert to the personal wealth of someone like Joe Manchin. They're never compromising on, on the environmental harms that that pipeline immediately started to cause the populations that objected to it being built. They never compromise around sanctions for Venezuela that are sending uh, uh, immigrants to our borders to the because border. of the economic yeah. disparity yeah. there, because yeah. the, the oil moguls in America don't want to compete with but Venezuela where, but oil. Where, but where is the president? I actually agree with you on the sanctions thing 100 percent. And some Republicans actually have argued maybe we need to relieve the sanctions. Like we got to do something to stop these yeah. people from coming to the country. But, but Brie, when you make those arguments, as even as a conservative, as some members actually have in the past, then Democrats, not all of them, but some of them, including the president, say, well, they don't, they're, they're othering this thing. They don't want those other people coming into the country. No, we can't just let any and everybody come into the United States as if we don't have our own problems. These things are unsustainable. Well, I don't think an anti-sanctions argument is being framed as othering. But I do think that there's something really telling here about the fact that there are overlapping political interests here among Democrats and conservatives. But look at how it's being framed. Mm -hmm. Even Republicans, conservative Republicans, I'm sorry, uh, establishment Republicans are immediately saying, well, this is really the, the rebels are lining, aligning with the interests of corporate Dems. No, in fact, it's the alignment is among the establishment members on both sides who want 
to have a speaker who agrees to a status quo that is broadly considered to be unpopular. But they're, they're playing a shell game here, and I'm really fascinated to see if Kevin McCarthy can stick the landing and really continue to righteously expose the fact that there's only a bipartisan interest in the things that suppress the interests of poor working Americans. Now, I don't have a lot of confidence in his ability to do that. I don't think he's a, a real populist. But I'm hoping that he understands that if he's going to keep the public on his side, he needs to keep highlighting the interests that are important to them, not just his own personal career's interests. We also have well, a bit of a, a breaking uh, announcement here. Jim Jordan just announced he is running for the speaker position. Do you have any thoughts about that before I mean, we wrap? You know, look, uh, I, I know Jim. Jim is a long fixture uh, in, in the House, and I'm, I'm not surprised. I, I don't know. I don't think Jim. So when you're trying to run for speaker in this small amount of time, you need a really sophisticated staff to whip the votes for the people who don't quite understand how this process works. I think Steve Scalise Bree still has the better advantage because he's just been around a long time, his folks understand the process of getting people in sync to get the numbers you need, which is 218. The problem for Scalise, however, is his health. Mm. Will, vote, will Republicans want to vote for him not knowing where he'll be in, in, in 10, 12 months? And, and I pray to God that the congressman gets through this. He represents a part of my hometown in New Orleans. I've known him a long, long time. Uh, I, I just don't know if Jim Jordan can quite get the support he needs to get across the finish line, which goes to my overall point. I think this is going to last longer than 10 days. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a process, Bree. You have Byron Donalds, who's consider, considering it. Emmer is considering it. There's a lot of people who are considering throwing their names in the ring. That's going to only fracture the caucus. This just does not look good politically for Republicans, which goes back to my original point. I understand the position of Matthew Gates. But as a strategist, I am principally concerned with winning. We need seats and power to be able to enact a conservative agenda. If you don't have power, nothing matters in politics. And I'm not willing to throw that all away. All right. We're, we have more to say about this, including Donald Trump I know. throwing his hat in the ring. So do stick around. <laughs> we'll be talking about that <laughs> coming up next. <laughs>